All right, I'd like to introduce Yuri Samuel. He's a Python developer and a returning uh, Michigan Python speaker. Really excited to have Yuri join us tonight again. Um, he previously worked at Urban Stems um, and he enjoyed, yeah, as a data analyst, and he's gonna be giving a talk on pandas. So welcome Yuri, thanks so much for giving a talk tonight. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so I gave it a little bit of thought of like how I want to structure going over pandas. It's a quite an extensive su uh, subject in the sense that like the, there's a lot to pandas, there's a lot to discuss. We only have uh, 40 minutes or an hour. So just took away the key aspects that I felt like I, I used a lot in my, in my, in my last uh, role, but also like um, in, in, year, in the years past. Uh, on top of the presentation, I can put it in the I'll put it in the um, Meetup channel too. But there's like uh, the the documentation for pandas is, is pretty awesome. So like I would definitely recommend uh, read through it. Uh, when you're reading through it, you'll see that I, I definitely borrowed some examples um, uh, from from the documentation. So like it's uh, it, it's definitely a good tool to have uh, or a good documentation to read when you're diving into pandas. Uh, simply. Um, what, what, what is Pandas? It's basically a uh, Python library that allows you to, uh, to uh, uh, structure data. So basically like pull data in from different uh, sources. So you can see here, like at the bottom, um, so, sorry, it's a, a storing data in a tabular fashion. So it basically means like you have a data frame, just like what you have in Excel. It's basically the exact same format where you have like basically rows and you have columns at the top. The main difference um, between pandas and Excel is that, like for pandas, you you are very much confined to these rows and column structures, which makes like the logic uh, quite different than Excel. Um, however, um, it, it's very straightforward and like it's it's a lot faster. Obviously, there's a lot of advantages that you have when you move to Python that you don't have with Excel. Um, but like in essence, it's a good reference point to say like uh, it, it's similar in that sense. And then like basically the at, at its core, it's like you pull in data from different sources. So it could be a CSV, Excel uh, file, HTML, like whatever it is, you can pull it into like whatever it is. Like a, if it's an allowed data structure, you can pull it into a pandas data frame. And from, from that point on, it becomes an object that you can work with, which we'll, we'll do in a little bit. Uh, I have some code examples of, of like putting your data into a pandas data frame and then like uh, working with it. Uh, all the data that I will be working with is in a uh, tabular fashion, so like the exact same. Um, obviously, like what you'll see a lot of work is like usually you'll pull data straight from the database. Um, we won't be covering that here. Like I, I just uh, I'm purely focusing on data that like is 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 pulled in from a CSV. Um, but it's the exact same concept. Like once it's in the, uh, uh, the, the main difference is, is how you pull it in. Uh, otherwise, like once the data's in the data frame, it's the exact same, uh, same way of operating. Um, I'll leave these, I just, so basically like you can, once it's in a tabular fashion, you can select like individual columns or individual rows. Uh, this is usually do like done to sort of like narrow down the data. Um, but I'll show that in a little bit, like when we're actually going through it. Um, so I'll just, I'll just leave this and that's probably a little bit redundant. But like, let's first, um, so I'll write some code to just show you like what it looks like. Um, so, Import pandas as pd. Uh, this, of course, importing the library. Now I have here. Let's copy this real quick. So um, this piece of code is pretty standard. This is just a read CSV. So you have here pandas, which uh, uh, points to the library, and then like the read CSV. This can be a wide variety of things, but like this is basically what enables it, allows you to like read the CSV. This is the check CSV that in this, in this instance uh, is my data source. So my data source is a bunch of random data that I make myself. Um, always work supply chains like this is stuff that we would normally have like a, a different data sources or sorry, different um, 
supply chain related information. So where you would ship product to, where it would come from, uh, revenue, uh, adjusted amount for, for inventory purposes, et cetera, zip codes. Uh, and then like you have a purchase time uh, and a purchase time index on this index. Um, yeah, but basically here you can see like these are the columns that are being pulled into the data frame and these would be then all the rows. So like when we go in here and we say, I just pulled this in. So if I then do a print DF and I do run, then what we'll see below, print DF and run, is a short summary. So like I can use the head function too, that you pull the, 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 um, the heads of, of the of the, the basically the top five columns. Uh, but here you see like a short summary. So you see that this data set is 173,112 uh, rows in total. And this is like the first uh, column and this is the last column. So there's different ways to check. So like if everything made it in, so if you do columns, do you have columns, we run it. So now you have just like this, the index for the exact same objects. So like here you see, like these are all the columns that live in the, the data frame object that I just created. Uh, see, so data types object. Um, when you're pulling in data, so like um, I'll uh, spend some more time on it a little bit later on. But basically when you're pulling in data, so like at this stage, like usually you would be, um, you need to properly like scan through the data. So like what you, if you do the day F now, so like if we do print, uh, oops, day F dot D types. So what we see here is like here, you see uh, all the different columns and then like the up, uh, the, the type, uh, each column has, has been uh, assigned to. So what you can see here is purchase time index is an object, product is an object. Now this is uh, automatically assigned. So this is likely because it's uh, mostly a text, a text based. Um, most of the data in this in this column is text based, and you see adjusted quantity um, automatically got in sixty four in it. Now, like in this data set, I haven't done anything with the zip codes in my examples, but like with the zip codes, you can see that some of these 170,000 rows are not solely uh, numbers. Like, so there is something in this data set that is uh, not allowing this to automatically jump to be an int 64. So um, usually when I uh, pull data in or like you work with it for the first time, you kind of like um, fire off like some of like these these early sort of like indicators that you kind of like uh, try to assess like what you're dealing with and like where sort of like the data might be a little bit faulty or like uh, not what you would expect it to be. So like in my mind, a zip code would be five digits. I would, you know, I would have to dig into like, right, which rows would have like something else and like what happens? Like is there some sort of like... Uh, uh, missing, like wrong data, missing data, or like whatever the reason may be. Um, so that's no going a little off topic here, but like this is pulling in data. So like now we have a data frame. Um, now what we can also then do is uh, we can print, uh, for example, a individual column. So like if I say, uh, I know it's product, uh, print they have product. Uh, now you can see I'm just printing the one column with 173,000 rows, but like now I'm just looking at the, in the uh, at the column of this product. Um, you can it's a little hard to do that like this. I do use the debugger from time to time um, when you're using pandas, and the main reason is you can actually hear in the debugger. I can't see it. Pull up the data frame. So, like, an, and then what you would use this for is um, just to like so you're able to like glance over um, the data at the stage where you're at. So, like, in, in this sense, like I'm, I'm printing the row with product, and if there's something that like I would I would say is out of the ordinary um, at any stage, like you can uh, pull the data frame and then just like double check like whatever's happening. 
Um, even kijken hoor. Zal ik Winger looking at uh, individual columns? Let's rerun it as a normal thing. We can also look at things that like we would find interesting to know before we start like manipulating the data or like start our analysis. So like for example, if we look at the revenue column, um, I would want to know what like the highest number is in the revenue column, just like for the sake of like seeing like, right, what's the highest number? What's the lowest number that I would have in this column? Um, just kind of like the spot check. It's, it's sometimes you use it, sometimes you don't, but like it's it's kind of like um, when you're working with graphs or like you're going to push this data later on, like how you've manipulated it into other uh, visualization tools, you would kind of want to know what the range is that like your graph doesn't become like, you know, it's 25 all the way and then like you have one unit of measure that says 15,000 and now all of a sudden your graph looks really weird. Um, and this, this kind of stuff like would, would help you uh, prevent that. Um, just spot check it. And you can also, what I use a decent amount is point this, right? So describe basically like uh, picks all everything that it knows is an integer. So in this instance, it left out the zip code column, for example, because the zip code column is an object, right? So there's something wrong in there. So that's why it's not being treated as an integer. But other than that, like the all every column in an integer here, it's grabbed. Um, and then like uh, it does some automatic um, Exercises on them, which is basically like you have the count. So this is the number of, uh, of rows. You have the mean, so that's the, the average. You have the standard deviation. You have the min, uh, the bottom 25%, the 50%, and the 75%, the most common numbers. And then you have the maximum number. Or the 25% or 50% or 75 or. So this this helps you just like to have a quick glance on like right, like what what's the data that I'm dealing with like is there anything out of the ordinary that I wouldn't be expecting uh, wouldn't expect and uh, etc. Um, in in this data set, um, what you what I found a lot so like especially because this in a example we're using a CSV is like um, a lot of coworkers nine out of ten times are so familiar with coding. So like the pro the the data that you get sent to you if if it gets sent into this format in the CSV format, sometimes would have like totals like that. Uh, at some point, someone uh, added totals in the in the data set, right? Especially if it's one hundred seventy thousand rows, easy to forget, easy to like miss or whatever, and that would really skew skew the data. So like in um, in this instance, like. Um, this step is very important in the sense like you're just looking for something that's like out of the ordinary uh, when you're loading the data into your data frame. Uh, you just want to make sure that there's nothing weird before you start working with it. Now then um, we can also uh, select uh, a subset of data. So like if I do if above two is the uh, adjusted, oops, adjusted one, and that is higher than two. So what I just, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, uh, I want to create a new data frame object, uh, which is called DF underscore above underscore two. And that is, uh, the DF that I originally created, that's this, uh, flows right through. And then I want to select and every row that in the adjusted country is higher than two. And uh, let me can print that. Let's go paste this. And now we can see we only have 1130 rows. Um, the index still like these row numbers see like uh, whatever 172,000 um this index number had uh, an adjusted quantity above two but you can see that the total numbers of rows is 1130. if i were to start uh say that this is the new data set or we want to move forward 
at this point, I would want to like re-index it. So basically the, the index is always like the first column. Um, I'll go into that a little bit later, but basically this is just um, everywhere was a number, one, two, in this case, 173,000. Uh, so those these ind individual indicators sort of like go with the rows. If you want to work with this data set uh, moving forward, you would want these rows to sort of like become one to 1130 in this case, so that like it makes sense, right? Like when you're referring to it, like it, it doesn't get like uh, overly complicated. Um, I have a quick question. Sure. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm I'm still learning Python as well, so just bear with me. Um, yeah, no worries. Um, in the um, brackets adjusted quantity in single quotations, what what exactly is that doing for the data frame variable? Like, how is that modifying so, the data frame variable? Yeah, that's a good question. So, in essence, what the brackets here are doing is this: these brackets open, sort of like I'm looking at this data frame, and then in this data frame, I'm I'm looking at this column, if that makes sense. So like when in, I'm basically, I'm opening the data frame and I'm saying in this data frame, and this is the column. So like when I go into my Excel file, adjusted quantity, that's it. So I'm looking at this guy. Okay. Okay. So, so you gotta, you gotta envision the data frame as literally being the same thing as the Excel file. Oh, that's really it's, cool. it's, it's different, okay. but it's, it's like, um, it's the exact same thing. So right. like, let's say I would say, I would name this two. It would throw me an error because like that doesn't exist in the data frame, right? This name should be the yeah. exact same as, as what I uploaded unless I rename it or something. So if you wanted to reference the, the, for example, the column state, you would write state right there, right? Yeah, so let's, let's, let's yeah. do that. Yeah. So let's say state and then I'll do an equal to and I'll uh -huh. say, I don't know if it's in there, but I'll uh, add my, see if it's in there. Then I think the F above two. I get everything, all the states that the equal state. Alabama. Wow. So it's very easy. It's, it's, it's very put numbers in. These you are just put just... the name of the column. No, you just put in the name of the column. That's very easy. That's very interesting. Yeah. So you just, and then. Obviously, this like I I can do equal to mm -hmm. with names, right? It's a string. I'm comparing a, a string towards a column. You cannot do mm -hmm. that. Um, you can, I can't say like look in this column and anything that's greater than Alabama, like that's not going to work, right? Like because it's not an integer comparison in that sense. Question? Yes, like, of course. Question: uh, Can you put? Can you say Alabama and other states? Like when you put three elements after? See what I mean? You After can, Alabama, but then you'd you have to use, comma. I think from the top of my mind, it's like, is in states, the thing, from the top of my mind, I think it's the is in operator, but do we, it would be a little different, uh, but yeah, you can, yeah, you can do that. Okay. I think so. Okay. Oh, there you go. I did have an example. So... This is the example that you talk. So basically, here I open the, the data frame, and uh -huh. uh, I'm looking first at like in the country. I'm looking at county, uh, every country that I've never heard of county, but um, it's the first first county that popped up, and then I'm looking as well as uh, the Los Angeles County. And then basically, what this is is like I'm opening the data frame. In this, I'm saying like the, the the data, the data frame, the column county, if it equals this, I want the row. This is an or operator. So like basically it's the same as um, as this or. Um, and then I say, or if the data frame county equals Los Angeles, I also want the data set. And then like if I just called it a little different, I called it TF2. And then when I run it, um, it would give me all the counties that match that name. So you can see here that I only have Los Angeles and uh, Cuyahoga. Yeah, that, that's Cuyahoga County. That, that's in Ohio. That, that's where I live. And that's where you live? <laughs> yeah. That's a happy accident. I didn't know that. But uh, right. Sorry, how did you pronounce it? That, that, it's, in Ohio, it's in Ohio, Cuyahoga. 
Cuyahoga. It's, okay. it's a it's a Native American type uh, um, name. Oh, that's very cool. I didn't know that. Sorry for um, no, mispronouncing. Uh, no, that's fine. No. Oops. So yeah, so so this is how you. you um, I was looking at you can also do. Um, you have several operators that would do the exact same thing. So like this is fine if you're looking for two things. If you would be looking for ten things, I'd be looking at a different operator that like you can hold it against a list. I'm saying when it's on my mind, I think it's is in, but I would have to I have to have to look it up. Um, sorry, no, I don't think it's is in. Yeah, but long story short, yeah. So you can look at different like at uh, at multiple things at the same time. Thank you so much. F guy, where? So, all right. So another big one that, that you use a lot is if you grab this data, so I just copied this like this. So I'm adding some codes and basically what this is, this is the exact same thing. So basically what I'm saying here is I want to create a new data frame, DF3, and I want it to be comprised, comprised of like DF2. So here, this object is now the one that I'm referring to. So like I'm opening the data frame, I'm looking at the column state and here like the operator is not NA. And what that means is like that there's uh, not no data in it. Um, yeah, so basically what that means is when I go into this data set and I go down, I can see a lot of blank lines. So when you have missing data and you're pulling this into your data frame, you have a couple of options. Like option number one is, is that you find a way to like fill this in. So you're gonna, you can do assumptions, right? So I can say like, all right, I know what the zip code is. I have no idea what 21 and 27 is, but like whatever the state is and the city and the, the county, like I'm gonna run this against like another Excel file that contains this information so I can populate it and use it. Uh, you can also choose to um, say, like, you know, I, I don't know what this is, right? Like, this is just missing data. I do not know which state it is. Like, there's no way I can find this out. And uh, I'm just going to drop it. Uh, and that's basically what this NA function does. Like, it's it's um important step, step in, like, data cleaning in the sense that, like, um, you need uh, at some point, uh, if you would want to, like, let's say I want to uh, group by, or I want want to like um, do um, formula, of, so like um, additions or like subtractions, like on on these on these columns. State flips would like um, would throw an error because like the like some of these. Uh, if I, if I were to say like I'm I'm multiplying this column with this column. Once they're not populated, there's nothing to multiply it by. There's no zero. There's no nothing. So like this is just like a blank, uh, a blank spot. So you gotta populate it with something. So like you can either say like, look, this is all a zero, and then like call the day and like move on. Um, you could say like I'm just deleting this data, or like um, I'm finding like I'm, 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 uh, I have a way to like populate this data uh, as I know what the issue is or I know what the correct data is. Um, in this instance, like I'm choosing, like I want to drop everything that's not populated, and then like DF3 would then just be the same data set, but like now it, there's no blank spaces in the column state. So if it's not the column state, um, it would still be, um, it could still be blank, but any blank spot in the column state like gets dropped. Um, you can do this for the whole data frame as well. Uh, you can do it per column, per data frame. I, then be a little careful in the sense that like you don't want to um, kick out too much data if you use this just because um, you know the, your variation um, which original originally started with like 170,000 transactions if you start like kicking them out like you're um, you know you just move away uh, from your 100 percent uh, data source of data raw data that you you, you use um, it's useful it, it you'll use it quite a bit, uh, so it's useful too. Now, then the other big thing that I use is FGAC, or is in county. So, is this guy, 
And basically what this guy is, is I've run a okay, state. So when I've I need to keep this guy in. So um, what I'm doing here, sorry for that, basically no confusing, but uh, what I'm doing here is I'm pulling in uh, my data frame and I'm saying in the column, adjusted quantity, everything that's above two, I want to like uh, mark that in the DF adjusted quantity above two. What this does by default is it creates another column and it would say for each and every row that it's above two, it gets a true. And if it's not above two, it gets false. Um, you would, I've you like I use this quite a bit in the sense that like when you're moving through logic, like sometimes you want uh, to not just filter on, you, you would want to reference like what's higher than two. And like, you would want not want to be stuck like to a number. So, like you would want to like group by certain events or whatever the case may be. So in this case, like it would be very interesting to say, like, I don't want like the county. I don't want like any other information. I just want to like be able to like down the road, say like everything that's like above two. And that's true. I would want to pull that in into like whatever um, data event, like or data uh, cleaning access or, data processing thing that what I'm working on, right? Like what I want to present outwards. Now, and then like um, here, what this does is this is uh, just a, lo a locator function. And in this locator function, I'm looking at the DF. So in this step, I've created a new column in my in the data frame. So like if I go, I turn this off, I just kill this to make it, um, a little easy to read. So let me just So when I print it here, you can see like I've just just a quantity, that's the original column. And what's added is just a quantity above two. And that's the one that I just did. So when I go here, I can say like, well, my, if I want to make I want to make a new data frame, and in my data frame, I want to locate in the column, adjust the quantity above true, everything that equals true, and then I want the county. I could just say, oops, check this out. And then in this instance, I would just get the counties of like the instance, like where um, the adjusted quantity was above two. Um, I was kind of like, I, I don't think it's the best example. I was kind of like struggling to find a good example, but like you, you, but I found, I, I use this quite a bit. If you have several steps of like stuff that you want to hold your data against. So like I, what I found is like, you have uh, several events where it can be true or false, like whether it's good or bad. So like, let's say you have an order and that order moved from A to B. Then you would want to say like, right, when the order arrived at the warehouse, was there a quality complaint? Well, that's false. And then like, was there, was there a quality complaint at the next step? Well, that's false. And then like, there was a quality complaint at the third step. That's true. They would want to be able to like see those different events and see like that there's a quality complaint and then like have, um, and that spread out. So that the later in reporting, you can like dig into it like and, and pull, uh, pull out uh, the, the, the data that is relevant uh, to your report and you're not confined to sort of like the snapshot or sort of like um, yeah, the, 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 the filter data, uh, if that makes sense. I have a quick question. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I'm just trying to get a handle of like kind of visualizing all of this in my head, especially like how the data frame is structured. Um, so it's like a two dimensional mutable, like, uh, objects. Um, and I'm wondering like with the data frame, uh, and then you're manipulating the data frame through pandas, um, like say like an Excel sheet or something like that. So how, how, uh, data structure wise, like, how is that done? Is it like done through... Like, are they using a linked list or is it just like some kind of fancy array or um, 
you know, and it's, it's, and is it and is that even important to know? <laughs> I may be asking like a dumb question, but yeah. So I do know it's I do what for the top of my mind it's an array. Uh, I'm not entirely like I haven't read up on like how it exactly works. It depends on how far you go into pandas. I would say like the first sixty percent of pandas is pretty straightforward how you use it. Um, so like the stuff that I'm doing, like if you're playing around pandas for a week, like it, it's it's not. You know, okay. you're going to be doing you're going to be doing the exact same thing. Um, when you have very large data sets and it becomes like uh, like sensory data or like stuff that you really have millions and millions of rows and like the the volume of data becomes um, so large that like performance becomes becomes an issue. Like yeah. I would say, like that at that point, um, I've I've seen coworkers like. Um, really become more sensitive towards like right like how does it work like how can i better organize it like where um you know i don't want to like exponentially grow my data set uh, to large volumes and i want to make sure that like i'm working with the data structure um but for my for my own like i my data sets don't go over a million row like at my previous employer right like i rarely had data sets were over a million rows so like for me, it's never been a problem if you have like a hundred columns or or hundred fifty uh, where you're selecting data, and then you just like as you're processing, like you, you obviously you okay. can so. Um, so kind of circling around your question, but like I think it's a race. I've never really had to the to, to dive into it. I've never had performance issues. Like usually, um, the the data volumes that I had, like uh, um, it works just fine. Okay. Are the is the data um is the data just being like the data right now is just being displayed right like you're you're just you're just printing the data it's being printed um in the interface and so it's not like actually being like kind of stored in memory or anything like that right no, no. so okay. yeah okay. yeah so we would come to that a little bit later in the, the presentation but like yeah so like um no it's it's in essence you're writing a script and every time you run this uh all these events happen again so i'm importing pandas again i'm importing the csv again and i'm running through all these lines of code one by one again so like there's nothing that, that gets saved you can uh just as you can read uh from a um csv mm -hmm. You can also write to a CSV. I forgot where I put it. And then it just all gets garbage collected or whatever. Yeah. After so I, yeah, I just commented that. So in, in this instance, um, I'm making an Excel of, of this DF, right? So like I have the DF to Excel. So let's put that maybe at the end, right? Let's say like put the DF2 to an Excel and we call it DF2. Um, you would have to comment this out, like, uh, open pixel. I have to install, am I forgetting? I think so. You'd have to pip install open pixel, I think. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, never mind. Um, oh, this is too serious. Sorry. That works. Sheet name analysis. I do not need this. You would argue machine name. Oops. Thanks. So it did run this instance. So you can see here now. So like now I created a new CSV um, um, with the data. Right. So now if I click open this. Two screen view, no, it's a, there you go. So this is the data set that we've just been working with. You can see like here it follows the index. So whatever is like blank is now blank. Um, but this is what it looks like once it's exported. Okay. Um, yeah, I feel like my, actually, I feel like my question was like, had a really obvious answer, sorry. But yeah, okay, thanks. Um, it's, it's uh, I, I, I struggle with it too sometimes. It's just like it's, it's hard to visualize, like when everything. Uh... All right. 
Well, so, I have a question. Sorry. Sure. Um, so potentially, can you make that 2D uh, database into a 3D database? 3D database. Yeah. Um, so, so, so now we have like horizontal line, which is the rows, and we have the vertical line, which we call them columns. Yes. Right. Can we have another line, which is the depth? That means, which, like, the, can you imagine that? So usually in mathematics, we can have x axis, y axis, and then the z axis. Yeah. No. Which gives it. No, you could not do yeah. that with storing data and pandas, as far as I'm aware. Gotcha. So it, okay. it would always be in the two, like in the rows and the, the columns. Column. Gotcha. You'd gotcha. probably want to use like a NumPy 3D array or something if you, yeah. if you want to do that. Hmm. Can I put NumPy into uh, the panda? Can I mix them? Yes. You, well, so you can import what's... it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So, so basically, what 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 I've uh, what what uh, what I use pandas for is like you you structure your data, you either you clean it, like you pull it in, it could be like you know from whatever data source it is, and then usually it feeds um, a, a visualization tool, and it could be like Plotly, it could be Matplotlib, it could be I forgot the one that you guys just said, but like um, it could be whatever. Like, but then like the data structure, then like you use pandas to filter the data basically, and like to right. organize it, and then um, structure it in a way that makes sense to it for it to flow flow on. Mm. Um, okay, I'm thinking about using it for a camera, so the camera needs to understand what's going on in my room, all of it. So it's a 3D space; it's the real world. Whew, what a tough problem. Um. Yeah, I would, I would, I don't have any experience with that. So I would be able to uh, be the right person to answer that question. Um, all right, let's circle back real quick. So, just gonna skip a little bit. Um, now if you have these columns, um, what we can also do is, I forgot, I'm skipping quite a bit. Can't be true. I'll just make it. So if I have day F, I could say day F um, revenue, then revenue just times or plus. Let's say I just do day F revenue, and then I call this day F revenue two in. I'm forgetting a comma. So in this instance, what I'm going to be doing here is um, you're creating a new column, um, which allows you to sort of like add two and two together. Let me just say, I just show this guy. So I've just uh, created a new column where I just say like, all right, I'm taking the revenue column and I'm adding the revenue column to it. So whatever the value in this row is, um, uh, I'm adding these together and I'm calling the output of this um, formula. Uh, I want to put that in a new column and that's called revenue two. Um, and that's what you're seeing here. So like the original quantity I'm assuming is, is um, let me just put that real quick, 25. And then uh, after the formula, see, it's two plus two is 50. Uh, you basically, uh, like you can just manipulate data in this sense. You can like, um, yeah, do, do quite a bit. Um, you can also do this, of course, against um, regular things. So like you could just say like, I want to add 25 um, to it. And then like every, uh, row would basically um, get the number 25 added to whatever the original number was. Or if I say 50 is maybe a better, better example. Um, so in this instance, like, you know, the original value was 25. I add 50 to it, now it's 75. So you would, this, this kind of exercise happens quite a bit. So like if you have a FedEx cost breakdown, you have a shipment go from A to B, you have a breakdown of the cost, like you would want to break it out or like you would want to add things together or like like pull it out so that you can sort it, uh, or sort of query against it. Um, so like these 
these kind of operators like like um, um, really helps. Like you 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 use this quite a bit to sort of like create new columns from like to to, to create more of, of of a story with with sort of like bleach your data. Um, so that's adding columns. Okay, right. All right. So trying to skip a little bit. Like I'm kind of like <laughs> trying to uh, make sure that we're covering a little bit of ground um, before running out of time. And you can also um, add the whole column or sort of like do functions against the whole column. So like in this instance, I'm uh, running a um, exercise against a just a quantity column. So this is, I know this is between one and four. And you can see that the total of adjusted quantity, uh, so each individual event is 197,000. If I, if I make this revenue, uh, every individual transaction in the revenue column equates to whatever, seven or eight million um, instances or dollars made or whatever. So this, um, so you can like basically like uh, work with the data like in a row format, but you can also like um, work at it like at, in the sense of like you can add everything in like one column uh, together as well to just um, pull stuff, you know, um, get results or like um, um, get an impression of like what, uh, what the data is like. And once you start working with the data, um, a thing that I use quite a bit and I'm sure that everybody else will too, is the group by function. So the group by function is uh, basically what this is, is you are grabbing your data set and you are saying, um, I want uh, the whole data set to um, be comprised so like I'm I'm basically grabbing my data set and I'm saying in this instance, got the right to state. I see here, it's to state. So state variation. No state variation. So I'm saying like all right for the column um, state, I want to group by all so like the all the individual instances in that column. So like in this instance, that would mean that like all the rows that have Ohio in them uh, would get grouped together. All the columns of Michigan uh, would be grouped together. And then what do you want to do with like all these instances, right? Because now we have zip code, we have this, this, we have purchase, we have product A. And then like what you see here is like basically what happens is like it sums everything up. So like uh, Python in that sense is very flexible. So like it just in... Um, um, this instance um, added all the strings together, which is, is not particularly helpful. It's like I, I usually uh, throw these out, but if you if we say like uh, point the revenue, in a second, you can see that like it's summed up. Um, yeah, it's kind of skewed because I didn't add state, but like you can see that per state, you now have the total revenue number because I grouped by the state. And that means that like all the rows that like match the state value, like got grouped together. In the group by function, you can go a lot more complicated. So like you can add several stairs of like grouping. You can add like different different kinds of formulas, like um, the, the string uh, example, what you just saw that you get like a giant string in the cell. Like normally you, do, you would want to kick those out uh, before like uh, the data frame gets created. So you don't get like ballooned um, data frames in the middle of your code. Um, um, yeah, so, but it's very useful tool. So like, I would definitely say like, this is, um, I, I use this a lot, especially because um, in the last stages before you push it into a graph. So like, if I were to have a graph and I would say like, I, I have done all the different uh, data cleaning and stuff like that, what I would want to do. And like, I just want to know now per state, like what this is, I'm going to push this in the bar graph or whatever. Like nine out of 10 times you would use a group by a function with some parameters to make sure like, all right, the data is ready to go. I'm pushing it out. And then like, um, 
matplotlib or plotlib will pick it up and then I push it into the. Um, so those are other libraries, visualization libraries would pick it up and then just uh, visualize it for the for the consumer. Um, now a big thing too. It's a little less um, useful as my data frames not to pick. It's just like you can, for example, count all the individual values of, of an instance. So like in distance in county, um, I can say like, right, there are in the column county 100 or 16,000 mentions of, of instances of like the object New York. Um, just like... Um, yeah, you would use that quite a bit just for individual uh, rows or like instances or just like to make sure like, um, you know, like later on, like when you've manipulated the data a couple of times that like, you know, your instances, your, your counts are correct. Um, I found that I, I use value counts quite a bit to just make sure like for data validity reasons, right? If you've processed your data frame a couple of times, you ran different functions on it, like your output should be you know, like if there are 16,383 instances of New York, you know that, that that number should be there. Then it's good to like throughout the data frame, say like I have a couple of points where I'm just double checking that like I did not by accident kick out 10,000 of New York instances and thus like my outputs are like kind of skewed. Um, so in that instance, like I've used, I, I use other accounts quite a bit. Um, it's just like spot checks when you, you go higher down your code. Um, I'll just keep going then. I don't know if you want to, yeah, I know we're kind of running off time. Um, if you're okay with it, I'll just keep keep chatting. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So let me grab my... Uh, that's, so this, what we've just been talking, is like mostly selecting data or like running functions on data. So like it's either with columns, with rows. It's so like you're always looking into this this set. A big thing that you're usually doing is concatenating or joining data frames. Um, so what I was just, the example that I gave earlier about like the zip codes and like it's an object or like we're missing, you know, like some of the data is populated and I'm looking at like something like another data frame to pull this in or like another uh, Excel sheet or something. I would say like this is pretty common uh, in the sense that like you're looking uh, to join things together. So. For the sake of simplicity, I'm just pulling in the exact same data frame. And um, I'll just show two things that I've, you, I'm have i using a lot. Um, so what I'm doing here is this is like a merge function. So I'm calling the uh, thing. I'm calling a uh, merge. And basically what merge does is I'm looking at the first data frame. And then I'm looking at the second data frame and I'm saying, I want to merge this data frame into this data frame. That means merging on the left. And I want to merge on the column ID. And why do I do in this instance, the column ID? Um, that is because I know that like both um, instances of the exact same number of IDs is the exact same data frame. And like, so like this is the common denominator. Um, I could use this, like, let's say for a, um, you use it in a wide variety of, of, of um, applications when you're pulling in data from, from another source, because you can, for example, also merge, like, let's say this DF um, is my, my data frame and the merge one contains all the zip code data or whatever, like where we're send, sending stuff or like where different counties uh, per zip code, like uh, sort of live. Then like, um, merging it on the left and then I would say on zip code would allow um, the merge function to basically look in this data frame when the zip code on the left matches the zip code on the right I want you to add or like add, add the columns that live in a data frame and at that point you're you're adding uh, you're missing data you would still have to, to get it in the right columns but like at, at that point like you're 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 pulling it in so it's it's a very it's a very powerful tool. I, I find I use it a lot. So like you do, it, you have several different ways of merging. I'm just doing the left one here, um, but it's it's a very powerful tool in the sense that like you can um, pull in a wide variety of data. 
um, a way simpler um, example of um, or simpler um, in the sense that like this is more like when you're updating data, uh, Comcat. Uh, I've, I've mostly used it when I'm, I'm, I'm updating a data frame or there's new data or new context I want to add to to an existing data set or whatever. Um, and this basically all this does is like it, push, uh, it puts data at the bottom of the other data frame. So like you're assuming that you have the exact same columns, like everything is the exact same and like now I'm putting uh, data below it. Um, just like group by or like merge, you can go a lot more complicated. So like you can, uh, like especially when you read the panels documentation, like Conca can do a lot. Um, but in this instance, um, what I'm just doing is, and I'll print it out real quick, is all I'm doing is I'm grabbing the two data frames that I pulled in here, the DF, the merge, and I'm concatenating them. And that means that like, even though I have two times uh, the index of 173, 102,000, the total is 346, 226 rows. So you can see that it just put, it just doubled it. Like, you know, it just put the two data frames right on top of each other. And like now the output is like um, the concatenated data frame. Um, <clears throat> Now you also have plots. So let me just import Matplotlib. I really only use Matplotlib. So great tool and Matplotlib. You can do a lot with it. I mostly use it right now to, and I'm just getting a sense of like what the data is like. Um, did I add context? Let me just pull. There. So I just put two examples in there. Um, so I just, um, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with like how uh, graphs work. Um, you can go into it if you want, but like basically what I'm doing here is I call the data frame, plotting it. I'm saying it's a scatter plot. I'm saying the X axel is the adjusted quantity, the Y axel is the revenue. Alpha is sort of a range um, that this, uh, graph users, but uh, won't go into it too much. And then like uh, plot, basically your plot, here you're showing it. Um, so I'll just run it and then give it a second. And then basically it shows the distribution of the data point. <laughs> now in this instance, you can see like, this is not that interesting. It doesn't show that much. So we can okay, we'll try another one. Plot area fixed. No, sorry, I Nick. I thought I had an example. Like and like well, this I think the idea is uh skip plot. Sorry, I thought I had another example with like a light plot, but I did not. Um but basically what I usually do is I usually use the, um, uh, either a scatter plot to see like, you know, where, where the, the data sort of lives in like, um, the, so you can get a sense of like outliers in your data. So like if one of them is really out there, so like you can get a sense of it. Um, you can also like map it in a timeline. Um, so normally I would, um, it's a little easier, like, I usually use with plotly. So like if you have a date um, date identifier that you're using, so like let's say it's the fulfillment date or shipment date or whatever, uh, you can actually make that the index and then like show like what your volume is per day or like your volume per county or whatever so that you can get an, an, a good impression of like what's my data doing over time. So you have a good visualization of like, all right, this is what I'm working with. Um, before you're pushing it in, um, yeah, in your in your UI or your output, um, where you would, in essence, be doing the same thing, but usually you would be digging a lot deeper. Um, so it's just good to get a get a good sense of like what what's what. Um, now a big thing is that I use. Um, I'll do this this one last, but I feel like this is pretty important, um, or for me it is. This is the um, uh, 
your date time. Um, so basically what I'm just doing here is like, um, so supply chain use this all the time. Um, basically what this is, it's like I have a column in my data frame and that's the purchase debt time index. And this is basically the time that like whatever the event was that we're trying to monitor occurred. So what I would want to do in um, my later um, graphs is I want to um, be able to use this in graphs and I want to sort based on it. So what I'm doing is I'm saying um, my purchase time index within this instance was still an object. I want to make that date time, which was not originally um, when we looked at the data, the data types did not happen yet. And I wanted to make it the purchase time index, like down the road when I'm going to be working with like either a date rate slider or like whatever in, in my uh, visualization tools, I can make this the index. And then like um, when I'm working with, with plots or like when I'm working with whatever um, tools um, uh, that the user can use, like when they're, when, when they're visualizing stuff, like I can uh, set this column uh, basically as the index. Um, yeah, and then in the same train of thought, you can look at um, basically like in the day range, like, right, like what's the maximum date uh, that I had? Uh, what's the minimum date that I had? Um, So, okay, right, oops, this is this. Um, just to get a sense of like, right, like when did, did the, the data entry start? When did it end it? It's uh, so like, what's sort of like the range in between like my data is gonna live. Um, and yeah, so it, it's very like in supply chain, like this is, basically your bread and butter like you every like i would say 70 percent of like the data related questions like are um, in a timeline so like i rarely come into instances that you kind of would want uh, a total sum of like a, a complete data set so like with when you um sort this like your purchase time in this in this instance like by, by daytime, but for what it allows you to do is like create a timeline and then say like for that timeline, like I'm gonna max the max number of revenue or the minimum number of revenue, or you can look for anomalies, like you use a lot in like KPIs. Um, yeah, I should have, yeah, then the last thing is just like, when you have your date, um, your dates, you can also like um, add columns and then like add more context. So like in this sense, it's like, right, if I want to look at like all the individual dates, but the individual dates are not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the same data, but then per month. So like uh, basically what I'm using the date function from Python to look for like, right, all the dates in the purchase time index, I want to know which month it is. And you can do this for a week, you can do it for a year, whatever. And then like in the new column, it would say that month. And in this instance, it would be the numbers. Like it would say for January, like every uh, row that would like the date, the purchase time date would be in January, um, would, would have one. So like then I can hold a uh, group against it or like run queries against it or like um, basically process data based on, on uh, having it uh, live in a certain date range. I'm sorry, but... Another question, it's okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, so with plotting, um, uh, plotting the data, like what you were kind of doing before, um, because I'm also reading, like, I'm also, you know, watching you and also looking at the, like, the whatever documentation, the link that you yeah. send us. So, uh, what is the, because it's saying, like, to do the, you know, um, df dot uh com sum cumulative sum maybe i don't i don't know uh the that function like cum cum sum open close parentheses and then 
you and then you call the plot function and uh i tried that and that that came out but i'm i'm using jupiter so i don't know if yeah if it's like different but I'm not really sure that but so i don't know for the top of my mind i haven't um used jupiter in a little bit um i would to be honest i would just look up an example like look on stack like google it like look on stack overflow like it should um if like if it's if your question is it's like look uh, it's it's a key like what i was just saying like one of those numbers that you use with data cleaning like you want to sort of know what it um if there's no outliers is, is that the question like is, is that like that the function of it or is it part of oh, the sorry. graph it's, it's it was just basically like how to actually get like the visualization, like the, the plotting, you know, like to actually get, so uh, I saw, I, I saw you do it before. I just, I, I just missed. Oh, so I can I pull it back up. It's just not. Oh, okay. okay. Let me see where my example is. So I'm just using this example. Okay. Uh, so this is the data frame. So it's, it's, I do BF underscore one, but it's just because I renamed it because my example right. uh, at that name. You can name your data frame whatever you want. So plot is the one that calls it for mm -hmm. from that plot lib, and then scatter is the the graph type. Right. And then these are the two columns. That I'm assigning to the axis, the x axis, the y axis, and this is like sort of a range. So I get okay. Um, yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why the 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 oh. sum function. Like, I'm not sure why they're. It's in the plotting doc, so I don't. I'm, and I'm like, I don't know what that's doing. <laughs> so, um, but okay. Yeah, I'm so not sure. I, what I can envision is like that they give, they give you some some steps probably. Like what what I at the beginning of the presentation was referred to is like when you're looking at your numbers like your raw data uh -huh. if you don't like you would always want to see the outliers right because like let's say someone in this data set for 170,000 rows at some point said like i want to sum every revenue thing and that like is the last row right, right. i would get a giant number so like whenever i produce a scatter plot it's not like or a line chart it's not going to make any sense because it is going to be like one giant spike for whatever that <laughs> row is yeah. Right. And that's that's where they're giving me like like some tips to usually like find those outliers and make sure that you like you have a good chance of like cleaning your data. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um I have some more, but like uh, I don't know if we want to keep going because I kind of have to get ready also to you're going up north this weekend. So at some point, I'll suspect the car. <laughs> no, I think that was really good. I know there was also a lot of other questions in chat. Does does uh, yeah? Does anyone have like a couple more questions? Maybe for Yuri, he could answer. Yeah, let me check. I didn't see the chat. And as soon as I don't know what type of index you start, do we have someone that we have? Maybe one of the questions was um the yeah that's correct read CSV function as well, Yuri. Do you want to just explain like what maybe what a CSV is and what that function is doing and what the low memory um attribute is? Yeah. So the low yeah. Um, okay. So basically, the um, read CSV, CSV is a comma separated value document, which means that, like, if you, um, I'm visualizing this in an Excel file, but how you got to envision uh, a CSV is basically you get um, this guy and a comma and this. It's, it's basically a giant text file. So, like, it's a more, I would say efficient way to store the data. Um, and basically, yeah, when you pull it in, it's like you use it a lot to sort of, it, it's less cumbersome than an Excel file. It's easier to store like large volumes of data in a CSV and like move it around than it is with, with um, 
um, yeah, other memory types. Uh, that's how I found it. Okay, thanks, Yuri. Thanks Any other questions, anyone? Well, can you can you get instead of a read CSV? Can it be? Can it be from a camera, for example, or any other sensor? Um, um, so your camera would have to output the data in like a data format that you can pull it to pandas. You can put it here. Will it be different? Will it, will it be a different function? Like pd so, dot read something else? I haven't, else. yeah, I haven't worked with it, but so like when I was, I've, I've, I've worked in the industrial agriculture who work with sensor data there. So like sensor data basically is like you have or how, how, how I have seen it is like uh, you have a lot of instances, like let's say it takes a snapshot every whatever second. Mm -hmm. And then like that, that would be sort of like your your indicator. And then like whatever, I would mm -hmm. assume like it would store then the pixels for whatever yes. it's taken. And like that, that would have to live in the road. And like, I'm not entirely sure how that, that okay. uh, gets stored. Um mm -hmm. Okay, I, I kind of have an idea now. What about low memory? Would that be different? The, the part, the argument, low memory. Yeah, so low memory. So like, um, I I just, uh, in, in this instance, like I've, I use it all the time. I've honestly, I've not read up on like exactly like what the different <laughs> okay. like options are. So like usually we've used uh, BigQuery at work. Like I didn't, I didn't have to use it, but like I, uh, get like a you get like an error message. So it says like you have to add low memory. So that's what I did. Mm, interesting. So it's a Boolean, right? We agree on that. It's a Boolean statement. Well, and in, in this instance, like it's, um, it allows you, so it needs to select the data types. So like when I got the error, it just says like it needs to auto select the data types and like it, um, yeah, that, that, that's what it, um, that's the error I got, and that's what it, uh, it it suggested. Like added low memory, so that's what I did. Okay. No problem. I, I, I don't know if I, I should be saying anything, but like the way I'm thinking about it, uh, Shad, your issue is just, yeah. you know, you would you would take what I mean. It it's ultimately giving you some kind of binary code, like you know yeah. whatever picture videos you're taking, you know, it's going to give maybe like a binary value or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All you do is take all of that information and you can import it into something like a C Excel sheet, CSV file, and then yeah. the crap out of it, you know, like do all the <laughs> stuff you want with pandas on it. So, um, I mean, that's what it seems like to me that you. Yeah. Good thinking. Yeah. So it's just kind of like a matter of like taking all that data and like just putting it in the right format so that pandas can like kind of do its thing. Deal with it, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Dan, for adding the explanation. And uh... <laughs> no problem. I'm not a pandas expert, but <laughs> link to the doc. So does pandas add any additional capability to Python for? Uh, sorting or string manipulation, or uh, is it simply all about reading and writing files and accessing um, subsets of columns and rows? <clears throat> Sorry, Chris, I was clicking on. So you're asking like if it also stores text data? No. My question is, does the Pandas uh, library add any additional support to Python to do uh, complicated string manipulation. For example, there are uh, there are games out there, uh, video games that store um, gobs of data that um, relate to maybe uh, text strings of what characters might say in the middle of the game or um, names of places or things like that. And you want to go and hack that and change things around. And so you want to, you know, use use this to import some of those massive uh, files uh, that are mostly string data, mostly character data. And you want to do massive manipulation of it, like 
looking for duplicate uh, rows or duplicate statements or you know just just um, rearranging the text, um, looking for misspelled words and fixing them or you know. Uh, yeah, I get the question. So, so I've how I've used like a non tidy shirt example that you're giving. Like I've never worked with pens in that context. We have like um, our previous employer definitely like with uh, quality control data, like emails from customers and stuff that would just be stored in a row or like a column. So like you just have one entry, like with like a lot of text, and you can definitely like run complicated analysis against um, a, a text block or like run it against every text block in a column. Um, so like in, in the example that you're like giving, like, yes, if, if there would be an instance of like, I would want to know what every character said in this city or is going to say in whatever fictive, 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 fictitious city there is. And like, those are separate columns where like the logic allows you to sort of like push it in a data frame that then you should be able to like uh, organize, like uh, run it against it. Uh, and its core pandas is like set for like a data frame setup. So, like I, I don't, I, I'm assuming the data would be organized in a similar way, but like I'm, I'm not. Uh, well, the question was more about functionality that pandas adds to Python to do these things as opposed to, you know, yeah, I know Python can do all that stuff. I'm yeah. just, you know, and, and I know I know that there's a lot of built into um, Python language itself, a lot of string manipulation um, capability. I was just curious if Pandas adds more to it, gives it a little bit a richer set of functions regarding uh, anything, you know, to do with string manipulation that you're aware of. Yeah, not, not that I'm aware of. Um... But I would, I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it does. But like I've, I've not, uh, I, I've never. So I've, we've mostly, um, used like the Python logic, uh, sort of like on, uh, like you would write a function and then you go over, uh, each instance in a row and then like do, you know, like get whatever analysis you want to get done on it, um. But from the top of my mind, I've never ran into that. Like it was, panda specific. Okay, so um, thank you for that. And and the other question I had was about uh, data formats. And I think uh, Dan, you put a link there to a bunch of di different data formats. So I'll I'll take a look at that. But I guess the question was, can it uh, pull in uh, purely binary data, or is it mostly text data that it can separate into columns and rows? I'm uh, I'm not sure. Uh, on the io formats there are there is like binary formats there so there's like python's pickle and a bunch of other ones that i've never heard of even like open document formats and actually ms like an excel file that's a binary format it can also pull in uh sql directly as well ah okay uh and uh what about data formats from like data collection tools uh mf4 for example is that on the list i didn't i didn't google it or anything yet i don't see it on the list but i'm i'm not that familiar so i'm not sure chris um, okay no problem. no problem thanks all right thank you so much yuri that was a uh quite an event with lots of questions and i think we're all yeah all know a lot more about pandas so thank you so much that was really good yeah th thank you guys and uh, also thanks for the questions it was uh um it was uh, it was fun